so the idea is uh, actually um, also this uh, year in, uh, in FA, uh, so when we were discussing about uh, next year and Gerard was doing this presentation for uh, Germany, right, and he, I was there at some point and they said, well, if there are any communication problems, that's with reason. I was so embarrassed because I'm actually the last person that you should call if you actually have uh, one of these serious problems that you need a hacker to, uh, because I'm not really a hacker. So I confess myself. Okay, so the thing is, um, I was, you know, just uh, involved in this uh, work for communications for teams of uh, robots and more at the protocol design level and thinking about what kind of uh, properties would you like to have in the communications for uh, supporting these collaborative behaviors for teams of robots. So that has been my work already for uh, several years and I had a couple of students uh, working on this. So one of them uh, actually uh, came up in the, in the scope of the Kambada team. Uh, he came up with this uh, software that I will just uh, uh, briefly explain you later on. I mean, I think uh, uh, probably uh, some of you know about it and maybe you haven't even used it. Um, okay, so I will just, uh, I, I, I also confess that I didn't have time to prepare a very uh, nice uh, you know, uh, presentation and I also thought that uh, at this time you were not really expecting any kind of presentation. So I will do something, you know, uh, fast and something interactive. So I would like that you interrupt me at any time if you have any doubts and if you want to say something, because otherwise you're going to fall asleep and I would fall asleep as well. And it would be very uncomfortable to fall asleep in front of you guys. So, I mean, uh, some of these slides are generic, but I mean, uh, I will jump into MSL quickly. So, you know, what for these teams of collaborating autonomizations? I don't really need to tell you much about this. You know, from robust and wider sensing to uh, cooperative sensing and control, so efficient actuation. So there are many different reasons why we should use teams. Uh, of course, then collaboration requires communication because uh, sometimes it's not really explicit communication. It can be implicit communication, but some sort of communication needs to be there. Otherwise, we don't have effective collaboration, right? So uh, it can be from these uh, warehouses that are now a hype with this Amazon stuff and all these uh, things, right? It can be surveillance, it can be transport or uh, rescue, or it can be MSL. In any of these cases, we have communication, right? And uh, what for is the communication? So there are several reasons why we want to communicate among the, uh, you know, the agents. So one of them is sharing state and sensing, right? And uh, in this case, if we look at the characteristics of this kind of communication, it's typically short, medium-sized data and typically regular. So it can be periodic or mm, quasi-periodic, something like this. But we also have to communicate events. So something that happens, uh, we want to say, for example, in this case of MSL, we want to stop the robots because the uh, referee says stop and they should stop. And this is, uh, of course, we can convert event to state and we can have, you know, this information transmitted regularly, but uh, it's nicer if we just send events. And this is typically a periodic short data, but it has a specific requirement on, sorry, it has a specific requirement on reliability. As opposed to the previous one, if a given message doesn't arrive, we can wait for the next update and the state is regularly updated, and the second one is just transmitted, you know, from time to time. And if we miss it, then it's a mess, right? So it, it should be transmitted with some reliability in mind. And then, of course, there are other kinds of communication, like, for example, streaming multimedia, which is important in some applications. For example, in search and rescue, it's very important that the robots can establish a multimedia link with, you know, the front robot in case it detects someone, for example, a person, right? Establishing audio in particular is extremely important. Uh, but also video is also important in many of those uh, cases. All right, so we are going to focus in this one because it's the one that uses the, uh, you know, the medium more often, right? And the other thing is that because we are talking about mobile robots, the communication has to be wireless. And when I say wireless, of course, we all say, oh, wireless Wi-Fi, you know, or radio frequency. Not necessarily. It can be audio, right? Or it can be, you know, vision. So it can be any of these things. And this would be cool, I know, to have, you know, uh, new ways of communication, you know, with the robots uh, doing some kind of maneuvers or lighting up lights or doing something in order to communicate in other ways than just uh, uh, radio frequency. But of course, radio frequency is so convenient that we will use it for many years, I think. Um, 
All right, just a, a few things about the wireless. You probably know about it, so I will not just uh, I will not spend uh, much about this. You know that it has uh, uh, these uh, bands, and uh, uh, you know that it has several channels, but the channels are limited. Some of them are actually overlapping, and so we have interference if the channels are overlapping. And within the same channel, of course, we have interference if the transmissions overlap in time, right? So if they are at the same time, we have uh, interference across the transmissions. When we look at the topologies, there are typically two kinds. The infrastructure, which is based on access points, is the one we use you know, all the time. Uh, the nodes have to register in the access point and then they communicate through the access point. So all the communication goes up to the access point, down from the, the access point to the nodes. It's, it's interesting that uh, uh, some, of you are, some of you may, may not even be aware of this, but for example, when we send a broadcast, or a, 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 it's not a, a physical broadcast because it's always physical broadcast in this case, but uh, uh, for example, when we send a logical broadcast, it's uh, with access points, it's only broadcast from the access point down. When the, we communicate up to the access point, it's always unicast. So it's one-to-one -one communication acknowledged, right? Okay, which is more reliable in that, from that point of view. But of course, we can also have ad hoc, uh, which is uh, much uh, better when we have a large area and we may want to explore this kind of uh, flexible layout, right? Like, for example, when we have search and rescue cases, I think this is much more adequate than, uh, okay, a star. But in our case, MSL is a star, right? That's what we use because it actually facilitates and that we are going to take advantage of that. So I'm just going to tell you later on. This is a little bit about the uh, contention resolution mechanism. We call it the arbitration mechanism. So how does it work? The basic mechanism, we call it CSMA with collision avoidance. This is... Uh, this uh, stands for carrier sense multiple access. So it's basically one of those protocols in which before you transmit, you listen. And if there's silence, then you go, right? If there's something going on, you wait, right? Or you do something else. Either you back off or you wait until it's free. In this case, it's what we call a persistent uh, protocol because it waits until the medium is free. Once the medium is free, then it computes a random interval, and after this random interval, it tries to communicate again, right? If there is communication within this random interval, it stops counting time. When the medium becomes free again, it continues counting the interval. So you see that case, there's station A transmitting, there are two requests, B and C. Uh, because they detect the medium busy, they defer their transmissions. When the, uh, the station A, when it ends, after a certain uh, interval, uh, called this, uh, which is not relevant now. Uh, e, they, they compute uh, random intervals, which are basically those, uh, you see green uh, B, you see green and a bit red, and then you see green on station B. So the, the interval of C is actually uh, shorter than that of B, and so after uh, that uh, you know, interval of synchronization, when station A ends, then they basically start, uh, I can move, yes, I'm wireless, okay. So uh, they, they start here counting the random interval. And so you see this interval is shorter than this interval, so this one starts first. It wins arbitration. When this one detects this transmission, it stops counting time. So this little bit of time is actually postponed to the, after the end of this one. So when this ends, then this one counts this little bit of time, and then it starts going. Now, you can see that we may have another request here, another request there, and they are all trying to access at the same time. And uh, this just leads to a phenomenon called uh, threshing, which is the fact that if we have a lot of uh, you know, communication requests, the medium is really busy. It happens that we have a lot of contention here, and these random intervals are not enough to separate all the requests. And so the probability of collision is very high. And when the probability of collision is very high, then this jumps because if there is a collision, then they do a back off, which means that they jump, they wait for certain, a certain uh, random interval of time, and then they come back later on, which really creates long delays. And at a certain point in time, you actually uh, lose the, uh, the packets because there are only 16 retransmissions at most, and then it's gone. All right, a few observations. So is it OK until now, or uh, you know all this, right? Okay. Yeah. This the condition window is exactly the size of the random 
intervals that uh, each station can pick. So they will pick uh, one interval within this size, right? That's why it was there. It was not clear. Sorry. Yeah. So they can pick. Uh, it can be this small or it can be this large. It's actually uh, one over thirty-two of these. Ah, but, but I like to touch. I'm sorry. I have this thing, you know. Uh, yeah, and I love the screens where I can, you know, reach. But of course, I can't reach the upper part. But well. Uh, all right. So a um, few observations. Basically, this is a shared. It's a shared medium, right? So it's like I mean, look at here. I mean, we understand each other why? because we are talking, you know, one at a time, right? Now we can try to talk everyone at the same time, right? You know the consequence. The consequence is that we are not going to understand each other. It's basically the same, right? Now, if we are just a few, now I can detect when you start talking and I stop, right? And sometimes we have this interesting thing that we start at the same time, we stop, and then it takes like a few seconds until we actually you know, keep it going. But I mean, we are kind of smart. We have these random intervals and we detect very small differences. And at a certain point, one of us you know, starts talking before the other and the other waits, right? But this can happen, right? So it's very important to know that when we have a shared medium, there is no other way that we can communicate unless we serialize communications, right? That's the thing. Unless we do what we call frequency multiplexing, which means multiple channels in parallel. But uh, we are limited in that point as well, so we don't have channels for everybody. And so we have at some point to use the same channel. Now, a use of, uh, of this communication leads to degradation of communications. That's basically what I was telling you before. And uh, under high traffic, it's very nice to have, uh, or very important to have access rules. Uh, I will tell you a little bit what is TDMA. TDMA is, means, uh, stands for time division multiple access, which basically means that we divide in time and we give slots to different robots so that each one talks at, in its own turn, right? And so this way there are no more collisions, right? Uh, improve effectiveness of, effect, uh, of channel use. So if we do this, if we create a rule so that we talk one at a time, we don't need to do this uh, arbitration, right? And so it's very fast. We can really reach a high utilization level in the shared uh, uh, medium, right? So it's very effective. But it's very interesting as well to see that sometimes we have uh, periodic interference patterns uh, that cause degradation even with light loads. And this is very interesting to understand why. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, very common in scenarios where the robots uh, actually have to share state to collaborate. So imagine that we have uh, 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 some robots sharing state with a given period and other ones uh, with a period that is uh, you know kind of similar but not exactly the same and so the phases will rotate and that uh, there's a certain window in time in which they will actually transmit or start transmitting in very short uh, uh, separation and so there will be a high potential of collision it's not necessarily that there will be collisions every time but we may have a high probability of collision during a, a, a certain interval then they get out of phase and then they will be okay for half hour and then after half hour we have uh, uh, two minutes or maybe one minute a very bad communication channel and then again half hour okay and then again so this is uh, also uh, pretty much undesired so this uh, these are the, the the things that we have now i'm taking too long so i would like anyway to jump to another presentation that i have which is um an old uh, presentation from uh, 2008 with locks from uh, RoboCup 2008 uh, in Suzhou in China actually made by Kambada so from uh, they were made by Frederico so there was a student that was uh, working on this at the time so we did uh, a few locks right and uh, these are the interpacket delays that we measured from the different teams so how frequently were the teams transmitting? This is basically what it means. It's the histogram of the time differences between consecutive packets of the same team. And it's very interesting to see that we have a wide variety of situations. And whenever we have a close concentration towards zero, this means bursts. So teams that are sending a lot of information in very short periods of time. And bursts is, of course, the worst thing you can do in terms of sharing, you know, with a fair kind of uh, way, right? Because when you send bursts, you create the high potential for interference, 
and the other ones that want to share the channel will probably have a very low probability of doing it successfully. So these two teams in particular were, were basically preventing the other ones to transmit effectively, right? Uh, you see the other ones, uh, the bars on zero are not so high and they are more spread out in some sense, which means that they have uh, transmissions that are more separated in time. All right. Also, when you look at the size of the packets, it's very interesting to see that some teams use, you know, moderate packet sizes. Of course, packet sizes means a time of consecutive use of the channel, right? So long packet sizes, long interference. Short packet sizes, short interference, and you give everybody, you know, uh, the chance to transmit more closely together. So uh, that team over there was, uh, together with this, the two ones creating the least interference or using, doing what we call a parsimonious use of the channel, right? So using the channel to send only small bits of information. This one was also okay, although from time to time there were, you know, large, uh, maybe state messages. Some, I don't know what they were transmitting. That one was also fine. When we look at these two, I mean, these were probably sending raw video, something like this, right? So this is a very nice way to uh, block effective communication, right? So, I mean, if you can't win in another way, then you can try this way. It's, uh, but of course, it's not a very nice way, right? So um, we have to do something about this. These were numbers. So wide variability of packet sizes, long bursts. Uh, all right, so in some cases, of course, at the time, some people were still using B. Of course, nowadays, I think everybody uses A. And, uh, but with B, there would be a strong overload of the medium. I mean, it would be impossible to transmit that amount of information in B. Uh, very short in the packet intervals. Okay, all right, so all that. So problems um, that we detected regularly with, uh, with the Wi-Fi thing. Infrastructure configuration, so regular uh, wireless internet access in the venue created, you know, interference with uh, the games. This is sometimes uh, happening. Uh, team communications configuration, because there were typically teams that were not really aware about how communications work and had very strange and weird configurations of their interfaces that would create tremendous interference uh, with bursts as well. Uh, lacking of, lack of policing, this is uh, typically a problem. Uh, because if you don't police, you don't know what's going on, right? So if you don't know what's going on, I mean, the teams cannot communicate and then they think they're doing something wrong. And then the, the games are not really nice and, and it's, uh, it's really a pity. So, and also then the channel uh, overused by teams, which is a, a problem, right? So, okay, misconceptions. I think this is also an interesting slide. Uh, this is what we typically hear, right, about communication. So no need for restricting teams' transmissions, but unfortunately the bandwidth is limited. So, I mean, if we have a team abusing, then there's nothing, you know, remaining for the other ones. So larger bandwidth solves the problem. It's always nice when we have this uh, step in technology. When we were using B and we started using A, oh, it's a highway. We can send everything. Big bandwidth, right? Wait, it's just a couple of years and everybody will be using everything they have, right? And so we are back to the same problem. Every time we have more resources, we will come to the point soon after we start using those and we are going to use everything that we have. It's always the same. So um, use technology with QoS support. This is very nice, but uh, how can we differentiate the teams, right? So the team that pays more, if you pay more, you get a higher quality of service class. It's also a good possibility, right? Uh, no need for technical verifications. I mean, we've seen the problem already. It's also interesting to see there was a, uh, this year, um, there, there was a chance of uh, presenting an invited paper on the developments in RoboCup. I don't know exactly where, but it was Peter Stone that was doing it. And he prepared this two page abstract on developments, recent developments. And it was really cool. I mean, uh, you could see in just two pages, many different you know, developments in RoboCup in all the leaks. It was really cool. One of them just caught my attention. Audio communication in SPL. Wow, great. And then it said, one of the teams just tried using high pitch frequencies that you can't hear, basically ultrasound, in order to do communication across robots. And it was perfect. Of course, there was no one else using that. Cool. 
Now, the thing they were doing, okay, now we are considering using this for everybody. Cool, <laughs> cool. All right, let them do that. I mean, it's, uh, no, I can tell you, it's of course good to diversify. It's really good to diversify, but it's always the same. If the medium is shared, there is no way out. We need to coordinate. Otherwise, there will always be a mess, right? This is the, the, main, the main thing. Okay, so let me go back to the other um, presentation and uh, show you a little bit more about the things that uh, we've done and some of you probably used already. Uh, so our focus is on sharing uh, state team periods of I-team interaction. So we would like to do low overhead, so uh, somehow keeping uh, communications and computations under uh, control, so not exaggerating on the amount of overhead we are imposing, improve data timeliness, uh, and allow a quick access to data and age information. And I enjoyed really the, your presentation when you referred the importance of age. It has been one of the drivers when we developed this protocol. So uh, we wanted also to separate data access from data transmission. These are two very important aspects. So when you are executing a process that needs remote data, if you request the data at the time that you are executing, you halt your process, you ask for the data. When the data comes, you continue. And this means that all the delay of communication is inserted into the processing delay, processing latency of your cyclic uh, activity or whatever, right? Your process. So this is something we wanted to separate. So one thing is computations. So you have your processes going around and they are not at all influenced by the, you know, latencies of communication, completely separated. And then you have the communications on the other side and the communications, what are they doing? They are just, you know, making sure that you have local copies of the remote data that you need so that when your local processes need remote data, they just use the local copies. So this is the separation that we wanted to do. Okay, and of course the um, case study was MSL. So a couple of contributions that we did. So this, uh, that we call the real-time database. It's a simple shared memory kind of middleware. So I will explain you a little bit about it. It just uses read-write semantics. It's very uh, simple. Uh, and uh, it also gives us temporal decoupling between uh, application execution and communication, which is exactly what I was telling you before. And it provides you age information on the data, which is something that we also wanted to give. So this is what we call data access. Then we have reconfigurable and adapted TMA protocol is a way of organizing the communications in a shared medium. So this is the way that we coordinate transmissions in a team. It's a protocol that is self-synchronized, which means that it does not require clock synchronization. It just synchronizes on the transmissions uh, and receptions. Uh, team broadcast dissemination. So all the data is broadcast among the team or multicast in this case. Uh, and it copes with external traffic. This was very important. So it's done in a way that uh, even if you have other traffic going on, uh, and if it, you know, sometimes interferes with your traffic, your protocol still works, right? Because there are protocols that if you mess up with the nice rules that they have, they will just break down. And it's not the case, right? So it kind of uh, tolerates. So this is what we call data dissemination. So data access, data dissemination. And uh, this has been, uh, this code has been available. It was on, on uh, Google code, but then Google code had just been frozen. So the code is still there, but it's frozen. And we moved it to Bitbucket. And, uh, and so it's still there it, within the, this uh, RTDB. Uh. All right, so a little bit, these are not many slides because otherwise you would be uh, dead. But I think that uh, some of you already know something about this. So. Uh, this is just to give you an idea about the, the main topics. So we have several robots and in each of the robots we have this uh, database. And this database is actually a representation of the world state. Uh, and it has two parts. One part that is local uh, and another part that is uh, a representation of the data shared among all the robots. And this part that is shared is actually organized into a set of structures in which each structure represents the data shared by one robot, right? So in this particular case, uh, we have over there the shared part with three agents, zero, one, and two, and the local part. 
and you see this in bold face on agent zero. It's in bold face because it's its own part. It's where it writes its data that appears automatically or magically in the other robots, right? Robot uh, one, one and two, then they see the data from agent zero there. They read it from there, right? Uh, agent one writes its own data in it, the structure agent one, and then it appears magically on the other two, and then the same for agent two, right? So basically the interesting thing is that then all the processes, motion, vision, odometry, control, whatever, whatever you do, it's all using local data. This data can be real local, or it can be a local copy of remote data, but it's all local, right? This means that you do not include any communication delay in your processes. That's the thing that we wanted to do, right? Okay, but of course, then you, then you could ask, oh, then it's perfect, there's no communication latency. Wow, we sorted out, in the, no, of course it's impossible. You know that communication takes time by the laws of physics, right? And so the thing is that we are just decoupling and putting it elsewhere. So it's like the cap and then you have the carpet and you put the garbage under the carpet. So we put the garbage, which is the delays of communication under the carpet and we have nice process behavior in terms of time. But of course the communication delay is there. And you notice it when you actually do applications. Why? Because when you consume the data, it's local, but the data itself has a certain age. And as you said very well, so sometimes it is old. And so if it is old, then your process at the end, the outcome of the application will be you know, inaccurate. There's no way that, well, I mean, there's, there are ways to go around it, but it's, uh, it's inevitable anyway. All right, so uh, I already explained how this goes. So uh, zero uh, shares it, uh, its data, then one shares its data, then two shares its data, and that's it. That's the paper where we share this. All right, so the communication stack, we have the database with its local variables. We have the shared variables, which are the variables that are going to be uh, written and sent to the others. So it's from the local perspective what I share with the others, right? And then you have the remote variables, which are the variables that the others shared with me. And so I receive the variables from the others, right? So I have two very simple um, uh, uh, functions to uh, access the data, just get and put. Uh, so put allows me to write in the shared variables. Get allows me to get data from the remote variables. And then on top of this, I have all the uh, you know applications, right? Then this goes on top of this uh, reconfigurable and adaptive TDMA protocol, but it could go on top of other protocols. They are actually decoupled, these two layers, right? And then we have this uh, working on top of UDP IP but it could also be directly in raw uh, socket, but it's UDP is more flexible to use and it gives us this uh, uh, interesting part. So this goes then into the wireless communication. And uh, of course we have the wireless medium and we have all the robots with a similar stack. And then the uh, reconfigurable and adapted DMA synchronizes all the copies of the real-time database. That's basically what it does, right? So it keeps all the remote copies updated, right? All right, so a little bit about age. So what we did about age is that there's uh, actually a, a parameter together with, uh, it's, uh, together with each item inside the database. There's the data, actual data, and there's the age of the data. And so how do we compute the age? So whenever it's written with the, uh, in the producer side, we write something into the local RTDB and locally a timestamp is taken. Then when the protocol comes and takes this data item, right, this datum, to send it to the other side, then another timestamp is taken, which is T2. And then we actually subtract T2 from T1, which is the age inside the producer side, and we put it inside the message and it's going together with the data itself, right? And so when it comes to the receiver side, then uh, another timestamp is taken, which is T3, and then we do an interesting uh, thing because we subtract the H in the producer from T3 and we save that in this uh, field. And then when the consumer actually reads the data, there's another timestamp taken and then we do at the time that timestamp T4 minus whatever is already saved, which is minus T3 minus minus T2 minus T1, which basically means at the end 
it means that we do h equal t4 minus t3 plus t2 minus t1 plus an estimate of the wireless communication delay, right? So this estimate is a little bit fuzzy. It depends on how uh, well, I mean, so the communications are nicely separated and they, the delay is typically, uh, let's say, short and uh, not so, the jitter is uh, relatively small. Now, if the, uh, there's a lot of communication, the medium is really busy, then we will have a, a jitter there. And so the estimation of that part will be uh, a little better, a little worse, sorry. Okay, so you see data, we, we, put, we put it in the RTDB. When we do get, we extract the data and the H automatically. All right, so uh, a little bit about the protocol. So it's, as I told you, one slot per node. It's kind of a reservation, so we reserve one slot per node. Uh, there's a dynamic reference election, and this is an interesting thing because uh, when we have a round, you have to know where the round starts. So where does the round start? Is there, there, there? We did a version in which there was no start of the round. So it was like a window that was constantly moving. But then it could create some uh, fuzzy and uh, uh, phenomena or, or uh, artifacts. Uh, and then we could even have the team converging to different values. And so we just uh, um, came to the conclusion that we, we still have to do that. And we sorted those problems in a different way in an ad hoc version of the protocol. But here, we decided to just use this uh, way of creating one reference, which is the one robot that has the lowest ID at the moment. And that will be the reference. So it's a dynamic reference. And the other synchronized to him, right? So we will see that how that works. So we have, uh, in that case, the reference, they have all these dynamic uh, uh, addresses that always start with zero. So zero is the reference. And then one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. And then uh, what we actually uh, do is that the transmission of one is uh, Tx win after transmission of zero. And two is two times transmission. And three is three times, right? So this has the benefit of maximizing the separation between the team transmissions, which accommodates basically interference that there is in the medium. Now, if we have strong interference, we may have these uh, delays. Our transmissions can be delayed. And if our transmissions can, uh, are delayed, then what we do is that this interesting uh, feature of actually delaying our next transmission. When we delay our next transmission, this is like a phase rotation of your round. And, uh, and this is also interesting, because if we have one of those periodic interfering patterns that would cause you know, a critical period of constant uh, uh, you know, collisions or high potential collisions, with this way, you shift to the side and then you get rid of this effect and this is actually very interesting and very effective for that uh, for that purpose um, all right okay around phase rotation this is how we compute the the uh, phase um, one interesting thing is that only the node zero actually uh, compensates the delays right so the other ones they just use offset with respect to the reception of node zero right so this uh, was very important to allow a quick synchronization of the, of the team and resynchronization. This is just to, say, to, see, to show you how, how, how effective it is. This was just one particular case exactly in the same situation in which we used this adaptation and uh, other cases in which we, we were not using that adaptation. And so we had a round of 100 milliseconds. Whenever we have uh, uh, one of these jumps, it's one packet that was lost. And so with this kind of synchronization, without it, we have many. With, we have much less. And then sometimes without, we even had two consecutive packets lost, even three consecutive packets lost. And those cases were basically eliminated. And if we look at the um, distribution of delays, uh, when we have uh, our uh, you know, synchronization in place, you see that even with interference, but it's a periodic interference with pings that we are created here and with actually uh, even high load, you see that the uh, jitter is relatively contained, right? And so we have here a high peak in relatively low delay. And of course, in cases in which we don't have the synchronization and sometimes we have critical periods, we actually created a critical period so that we could see what could happen in that case, we have a much larger so about uh, something like about three times the jitter. And the average is also like three times larger, four times larger, right? 
So there's a, a strong impact in reducing delay and making your transmissions behave better. Right? So if you, uh, this I will skip, but this is just to say this was a relative localization that we were doing. And even at the application level, so look at the, the result of the, your localization with and without. And you see that the localization is really bad without the synchronization because of all the delays right the accuracy is much worse right because you know the delays are all uh, messy and the the, the the behavior of the, the channel is not good and it really improves the performance of the application just by improving the communications just by improving the quality of the channel all right so the final thing to, to show is that we have these two dimensions so one is uh, okay we create this round we have one slot per robot nice okay but if we did it just like that then you know perfectly well how dynamic the teams are, right? So sometimes you have one robot, other times you have two, then you have you know, five, then you have four, then three. So if you kept this, you know, if you include you know, the base station here, let's say you had seven uh, slots. If you keep seven slots all the time, then sometimes slots are unused, right? Because the robots are off. And this means that the transmissions would be closer to each other, which means more sensitive to interference then needed they could be more separated so this was the motivation to do this uh, kind of uh, reconfiguration of the round so we uh, keep the same round but if we have two robots we divide it in two if we have three robots then we divide it in three if we have four we divide it in four and this is always constantly being adjusted to the current membership which means the current composition of the team right it's constantly changing we still do the adaptation it's exactly the same so one interesting point is that we keep the round we don't change the round because there were other approaches in the past in which you know the slots were added the slots always have the same size and we added more slots or less slots to the round which basically meant a shorter or larger round and this is bad why because the uh, applications actually uh, they work on top of this round right and uh, because this round is how uh, you know how fast your data is refreshed, right? So if you change it, then you are always changing the properties of the timeliness of the, the timeliness properties of the data, right? So if you keep the round the same, the applications don't feel any difference. If you have two robots, three robots, 10 robots, or five, it's the same, right? So this is the reason why we really wanted to keep the round the same. And this, of course, really provides this maximum separation between the teams with any kind of composition. This is actually a plot from, uh, from uh, a play, a, a log from, from MSL play. So you have here, uh, the, this is uh, actually the node 0, node 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The last line is the next transmission of this one. So it gives you an idea about the round size. Right? So you see that the round is always the same, around 100 milliseconds, but then it is adjusted. You see those spikes? These are adjustments because of the delays that the other nodes suffer. Now, you see here is the actual membership. So we have six nodes. At this point, you see over there that the, uh, you see, uh, this is one, two, three. Three, actually, uh, no, actually, it's uh, uh, the red one that entered. The red one entered there, you see over there. And when the red entered, then we had seven nodes. Then it lasted uh, for a while. And then a little bit after the, uh, I don't know that color. OK, the a third, I don't know what the name, cyan, maybe. It's kind of cyan, right? OK, cyan is out. And when it is out, this goes back to six, right? Then there's a moment here in which the purple, uh, right, is gone. And when the purple is gone, then this goes to five. And then uh, it comes back again. And so it goes back to six. And then from now on, it's always uh, seven, except from uh, a few cases with a few spikes. So you see that the average distance between the transmissions is adjusted depending on the number of robots that we have uh, at, at each time. And so you see that if we have less robots, we have more tolerance to these delays, right? When they are more compressed, we have less tolerance, which is uh, normal, exactly what we expected now one important point you could ask okay but how long does it take to reconfigure right because this reconfiguration and how does it work just a little bit on the on the process so in order to actually uh, make it work 
we use a what is called a um, it's a an agreement vector or it's a, it's a vector that actually uh, tells you or the membership vector as we tell it it's um, it's just about time to end right <laughs> I will I will end right now and just coming to the end so the um, so basically we have a vector in which each robot says what is its vision of the team right so I say well I see robot uh, one two and five I don't see four and seven whatever and it shares this with all the others and so they all share this and by using this they reach agreement on the current composition of the team very quickly it takes about one to two rounds and then they resynchronize which means they reconfigure the round why is this important because I mean if I am configured with a round with three slots and that one is configured with a round of four slots it will not work right it might work during one round because it's like interference but then it has to be you know sorted out so it's sorted out quickly this is just a, a quick way to tell you so uh, important points so let's see node one is started there and when it starts it waits for uh, one period to see who is in the network and then uh, it starts after one period uh, one round it starts announcing itself when it announces itself all the others will detect the new robot and then they will integrate at some point the new robot and this will after this the uh, this is called the agreement phase and the next transmission of the reference will actually be already with a new structure and all of them will have a different offset so that they are adjusted to the new configuration with a new slot or a sl with a slot less so uh, then this is what we call the reconfiguration part now with actual measurements to see how long does this take right because this is without errors if we have uh, you know one of these packets lost then this can be extended for another round right and so we can have an extra round on the agreement phase because of uh, packet losses or it can be two rounds or it can be three rounds it depends how many packets you you miss so we did uh, you know a, an histogram of the lost packets in a particular situation exactly in the same log that I showed you before in the previous slide with those reconfigurations and in this case uh, we had uh, zero 22% uh, of the time of the actual reconfigurations they had zero errors so it was exactly uh, in the worst case two plus one rounds 65% uh, uh, had one extra round so it took uh, in the worst case four rounds and 96% uh, so plus 10 10% took uh, uh, two extra rounds which meant uh, five rounds and uh, and four percent used three rounds so you see that on average we have like uh, you know between zero and one and you can say with a round of 100 milliseconds that 96 percent of the reconfigurations took less than 500 milliseconds right so 500 milliseconds ah. it's pretty cool right so you can have uh, the whole structure of your communications being completely reconfigured within 500 milliseconds actually these are worst case bounds so it can be less than that right? it depends on the particular situation all right so uh, on the use of the protocol just to finish it's adequate to disseminate state information right because you know uh, we have the current state of the world and we update the state of the world and so we share it we share it we share it right that's cool now if we want to send a stop command or a start command so an event information is not really the thing why because it would imply you know extra delays right if we convert the st event into state then it would take at least one round of delay in order to have the information propagated and having 100 milliseconds delay with a stop command you can see the difference right you remember when uh, Kambada was using this uh, conversion that when there was a stop from the referee box the Kambada was normally moving like half a meter more until they, they could stop because there was at the time there was a use of uh, the events were converted into state and transmitted inside the RTDB but they can be transmitted as external traffic right and external traffic is still possible I mean the other team is using it so you can also use it so when you have commands you can use external uh, you know you can send your events and you can even send your events with retransmission approaches or with acknowledge ex explicit acknowledge to make sure that it's a reliable uh, command so typical behaviors collaborative uh, ball tracking or formation control uh, what whatever so collaborative sensing 
for strategic reasoning, so whatever, so you can use this for any of these purposes. All right, so um, this was done to support collaboration among autonomous agents through wireless communication, supporting or tolerating interference, errors, multipath fading, attenuation, whatever, and it's a way of sharing uh, information. So it's kind of a, it's middleware. And then we propose this synchronization, uh, this TDMA. It's, it's very interesting that it's, uh, you probably didn't realize, but um, uh, the node synchronized on when they heard the others. So if the others were late, then they also delay. That's what's, what delays the round, right? So they don't use clock synchronization, which is interesting because you don't need to add another service. And clock synchronization, we also compared, and we have measurements that show that this is also better. Because with clock synchronization, the structure is rigid. And if you have this periodic interference with those critical patterns, it doesn't move away. It stays there, still sensitive to that. And this one whoosh, just moves aside. So this is, is good from that point of view. But of course, it also has some other tricks. And uh, if you ask me, I will offline, I will be honest, and I will tell you the downside of this part as well. No, it's just, uh, but it, it's true that the thing is that if it's clock synchronized, you can synchronize everything. You can synchronize all the activities, all the processes in all the robots. And so you can have a state update that is just before the time to transmit. And so this data will be really low age when it is transmitted. And so you can optimize the end-to-end, -end, right? If you have this variable, you know, round, adaptive round, which is nice for some things, not so nice for the others, you don't really do this because there's no common clock. You cannot really synchronize the application level. It's harder, right? So you, 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 you cannot do that. So you, you lose something, right? OK. Um, all right. This is it. Effective RTDB shared memory, so you establish the, uh, the effectiveness of this. So it creates the separation of computations and communications, and it provides data age information, which I think is interesting. We are doing now is uh, you know, adding uh, admission control and admission control based on actual localization to use this on uh, vehicular networks. That's what we are trying to do now. So some acknowledgments first to Frederico, because this is the guy that actually built what you saw here. It was his PhD work. This was done uh, essentially inside the, the Kambada team. Uh, it uses infrastructure uh, communication. Uh, I also have to uh, state my uh, deep appreciation to the other student I have now, which is who is actually finishing his PhD now, but did a complete ad hoc version, which has completely you know, different uh, problems in terms of synchronization, because synchronization has to be propagated, and, and enforcing consensus in a distributed mesh is much more complicated. And, and he also did this point-to-point uh, -point in a mesh with routing and, uh, and relative uh, RF-based communication. And my last acknowledgment, of course, to the Kambada team, to the whole Kambada team that allowed most of this work to be done, and, uh, and many collaborations that actually allowed Frederick to do his work. So thank you very much. Uh, I would be more than pleased to answer any question that you have or any doubt. If I can answer, I would be more than happy to do it. Thank you. Long time, no? Yeah. <laughs> Too long. A little bit. All oh, right. Anyway, uh, any questions you'd like to address? Yeah. Why do you use UDP and not TCP? Well, the thing is, uh, we do uh, multicast. And so TCP does not allow multicast. It allows only one-to-one. -one. The other reason is that TCP has uh, all this uh, interference with the timeliness control, because it has this acknowledgment, the windows, and stuff. And so you cannot really control timing with TCP, right? It's a little bit strange. But uh, essentially, you cannot do broadcast. What you could do is one-to-one. -one. And we also did a paper in which we compared Maybe if we do one-to-one, -one, right, in all of them, uh, it's better. So because when you do, this is the other downside of the work, when you do broadcast, typically the speed of transmission is lower. So your packets take longer, and so you use more bandwidth, right? It depends because you can compensate. You can actually you know, uh, make it so that your device driver actually uses a higher speed anyway. But the, uh, the thing is that, 
uh, it turns out that the uh, when you send one by one, it's, uh, it's more complicated for your protocol. It's also uh, more overhead that you impose on the uh, on the on the system, and uh, and actually, it's basically if everything is okay, it's fine. If you start having errors, then it adds a lot of overhead because of the retransmissions of TCP. Right. You, you said that, uh, like humans, um, they are supposed to talk one not on each, uh, at each time. Yeah. Sometimes humans interrupt the other human. Is there any way on, on the protocol that we can, for example, imagine you are transmitting a kind of uh, piece of information and your information is more relevant at that point, well, to a point that you should uh, interrupt something and transmit you and the other way. Well, thank you for that, because that's a very uh, good question. The thing is, uh, one of the targets of our protocol was exactly to support that, because when you allow each robot to transmit you know, on its uh, slot with a lot of separation in between, you can allow a lot of traffic to go in between. So the interference that you cause to that particular case is relatively small. It can be one packet or two packets, depends on how much you transmit every slot, right? So if you slot, or if you slot, if you, I mean, when you come to this time of the day, uh, it's very hard to make sense. But the, um, so if you transmit only a, a short information, like only one packet with the update of the, of the RTDB, uh, then uh, this is the maximum interference that you can cause to another transmission of higher priority. Because maybe this transmission was going to go now and you just started doing a transmission of the other. So you have to wait until the end and then you go. Right? So it's, uh, it's much better than other cases in which you transmit uh, you know, large size of information, large chunks in a burst, and then this interference can be the whole burst. Right? So we don't have that problem for the moment. A uh, couple of questions, if we have time. Um, regarding the age information for shared items, yeah. uh, because of the problem that we have to wait if there's uh, uh, an interference with another transmission, yeah. and we don't control that, yeah. we can't uh, change the age right before transmitting again. Is there any hack that we can do on the on the driver or kernel or something that we can uh, also encompass that information of that extra age time that we didn't include before. Yeah. They, um, they are, I mean, there are several parts that maybe they are outside. So that picture with, uh, with the age, right? Uh, so Life if we go there, yeah. yeah. So if, uh, OK. All right. So uh, if you see this, uh, when you have interference in the traffic that creates delay in the traffic, then it appears here. We don't know it, right? So I, I think this is one of the questions that you're asking, right? So we don't know it, and, and to measure it, it's a little bit tricky. Because the thing is, uh, uh, it's already, when you send it to the device driver, you kind of lose uh, your control of it, right? You, you hand over to the device driver. I think that, uh, I don't know, but maybe looking at some device drivers that could exploit this uh, feature of like uh, uh, this transmit interrupt that tell you exactly when a packet uh, went out. Uh, but we never did it. So, but maybe uh, that way, but this means programming at the device driver level, right? So you need to know the device driver and see if the device driver gives you that functionality and allows you to enable it. Uh, changing the device driver, I don't know, maybe a possibility, but these are, you know, complicated device drivers, so I don't know. But uh, we never did that. So what we do here is that we did those uh, you know, uh, histograms with the uh, delays. And so we get you know, an idea about what we should use here. Right? Now, if the environment at runtime is pretty much different from what you plotted, then this will be different. An interesting thing would be to online, you do this histogram. right? You measure, you have an idea about the delays. It's not easy to measure because you cannot measure it from your side. So you need information from the others. But the others can tell you how late you were with respect to the expected transmission, right? And so if you share information about the delays, then you can build a distribution and you can online adjust this parameter, right? Now, there is something else. Uh, 
on the producer side, we can have something before this, right? Because when you are generating the data, then before you actually do a put, there may be some time in there. You, you may even have a preemption of the process. Some other process starts doing something else. And so the time from the actual capture of the data until you actually write it there can be, now this can be sorted out by using this kind of uh, non-preemptive function. So by disabling any kind of preemption between the actual sampling and put inside the RTDB. So we, that part we can improve. And the same thing here in the consumer, right? So once you actually extract the data. Uh, so these uh, are the things that I can tell you. Another question based on your expertise. Um, another solution for that would be to synchronize clocks and to transmit global timestamps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you believe that protocols like NTP and yeah. similar ones are usable in the conditions of a game? Or would you synchronize before a game and then just well, the, uh, hope? Uh, and NTP itself is relatively um, poor, right, uh, for this environment. It's too dynamic. The, um, and it basically uses uh, NTP, it uses uh, these round trip delay measurements that it does from time to time. And then it has the, uh, you know, the, the good clock, the master clock, let's say, kind of, or the upper layer clock that is used as a reference. And then it basically synchronized to that. Now, um, you could use other protocols. Uh, precision time would probably be better, but it has more, uh, let's say, uh, the way that it, uh, it works, it has, let's say, more, more overhead, maybe, in some sense. But, um, but it's much cooler, and it's much more precise. Now, uh, other thing is that there are other uh, protocols that are, uh, there's a framework that we've used several times, which is very cool. It's called Crony. And it really gives you a good uh, synchronization. You don't really care about anything. You just install it, and it corrects your clock, right? And then you can use your clock as a global clock. Now, you should be aware that this has a precision anyway that is limited. In terms of stochastic terms, you can actually achieve a relatively you know, sub-millisecond precision depending on the, you know, the, the load of your uh, system. But, uh, but in fact, it will always be on the milliseconds range, the precision, because it depends. If you have a high load with high variability of you know, delays, then there's no miracle. I mean, you cannot really compensate for, for these delays that are completely, you know, uh, let's say, unexpected, or you don't know exactly what you are going to get. And so you cannot really compensate for it in the protocols. Now, uh, I think clock synchronization is uh, it's really cool, I mean, because you can do a lot, right? Because you can synchronize in time all the robots, all the activities. The, the problem in our particular case, and that's what we are also compared and checked, is that if you use clock synchronization to generate this TDMA, you, what you do is that the round is uh, rigid, and the slots, when you create them, they don't adjust. I mean, you, you use the slots based on this offset with respect to this time. Uh, and this does not allow you to get rid of these uh, critical uh, interference patterns with periodic interference. Um, but maybe there is a way that you can shift from it. I don't using clock, so maybe something can be done there. I'm not really 100% sure that it's better not using than using. It's something that is uh, open, right? What is true is that you need to install it. For example, using Crony, you also need to know that Crony is a centralized clock synchronization algorithm, which means that if the master crashes, then uh, all the robots will, will diverge. But of course, they diverge slowly, right? But still, depending on the, the length of the game, and I don't know. But for the precisions that we typically use here, it should be OK for a game. It's the same thing with, for example, the uh, uh, ROS, for example, the, the, the ROS topics, uh, which, which all the connections are done by uh, this master, right? So the master dies, uh, I mean, if a robot uh, dies and comes back again, then it cannot connect with the rest. So it's gone. So it's uh, these things. Uh, that's why we did something that is completely you know, separated from all that. And it's completely distributed. Um, and that was the target. And so no need for clock synchronization is self-sufficient. And so that was the, the purpose. Yeah. You, that you can do that. It's yeah. What is typically done is this uh, fault tolerant average in which you get information of all the nodes, and then you see how far the clocks are. You just get rid of the farthest clocks from the average, 
and then you average the others and you use it as your reference clock. Um, in this case that we are sharing this uh, uh, agreement, we can also share the clocks and we can actually build a matrix and we call it a, a vector uh, or a, let's say a clock matrix because we can share the vision that everybody has about the clock of the others, right? And then we have on each line, I have a robot I and I have the clock of all the robots that robot I received. And then uh, everybody has this uh, image. Of course, it's kind of different, but then they can get rid of the clocks that are bad, and then they can do average of good ones. But then you have to do that, right? So it's extra burden, so we don't do that. <laughs> but you can do that, of course. Other questions? Yeah, during dinner, lots of time. <laughs> Uh, my question is that uh, we are now 50 minutes away from the schedule for oh, dinner. Just, uh, Lots of time. To me, it's, it's, <laughs> it's my, my usual lateness. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but I don't know if someone uh, still wants to go to the hotel or if you would like to go directly to the restaurant. S yes, you can. No problem. Okay, so... Can I, can I ask you something? Just a quick question is... If, if uh, those of you that have had the experience with RTDB, it's, uh, we never asked for it, but uh, having feedback would be nice. I mean, because, uh, I mean, this uh, Frederico finished his PhD, he's busy because in his uh, school, you know, they, you know, they give him a hard time with teaching, but still he would be, you know, interested in, in uh, maybe maintaining, collaborating and doing. We do some updates from time to time, but just to say that if you see something that could be, you know, improved, Update it, it would be nice. Just yeah. All right, then you let me know your feedback. You can say honestly, this is crap, man. I'm not going to use it. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. No, there is still, uh, yeah. you know, on many teams, but there is already some teams using RTDB yeah. at this point. With some, uh, uh, maybe they have also introducing some changes yeah. from their own changes, and of course, yeah. So that would be nice to share. That would be nice to share. Yeah.